Welcome, Joe. So great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Christine. Can you start off by sharing a little bit about yourself and Coda Capital? Of course. So, yes, of course. So uh, I'm Joe Blair. Uh, I'm originally from the New York and Connecticut area. Uh, I was an engineer uh, turned entrepreneur turned venture investor. So that's my uh, trajectory. Uh, I've been in venture investing on the West Coast uh, for the past seven years since graduating business school. And uh, I currently work for a firm called Coda Capital. Uh, we are a SF-based firm that's SEC registered, multi-stage, um, and we broadly invest in enterprise tech companies. Um, we uniquely kind of invest across both public and private uh, companies, uh, which is not typical in the Bay Area, uh, but, and we've invested in about 100 companies uh, to date. And let's see, what else? Uh, you know, I've been interested in remote work as an investment category for the past two years or so. So before it was cool, I guess, you know, you can say. And, uh, and so, you know, happy to talk about my journey through remote work, but I've, I've been investing in remote work uh, for, for about that time and, uh, and do a lot of uh, kind of advocacy and thinking uh, about the space. So, I mean, typically VCs are not really engaged with remote companies. So why, why is that? And like, have you seen a change? I mean, you've been into it, you said, for the last two years, but have you seen a change since the pandemic started? Massive change, massive change. So, so to put it in context, um, uh, I, 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 when I started to get interested in this space, I was actually coming at it through the lens of mobility. Um, so I, I was, at my previous firm, I was investing in, or, or, you know, investing in mobility companies, uh, invested in an on-demand electric air taxi company uh, in, in Germany called Lilium. Uh, and and the, the vision there is, okay, what if you could live in, you know, just to use the Bay Area context, what if you could live in Napa Valley uh, and commute to San Francisco instead of it taking two hours, it could take 20 minutes, something like that. Um, and so I started thinking harder about where people work, live, and play, and how that would change with a new transportation modality. And then I just started thinking about that to, at the limit, which is what if we didn't need to live where we um, worked? And this came to a head for me when I was, I was actually in Wyoming at a, uh, of all places, a, at a Silicon Valley roundtable with, with the governor. And we were all trying to, batting our heads against the walls, trying to figure out how do we get Silicon Valley companies to set up satellite headquarters in Wyoming? And I was just struck by the irony where, you know, there I am sitting in this beautiful log cabin mansion uh, with snow-capped peaks all around me. And we're trying to get, figure out how to get humans to live in this place where that I would like want to move like, you know, yesterday. So, uh, and if you think about it, and, and the, you know, the more I thought about it, what, what kind of haunted me was the fact that it, it is not a technology issue. And it, it wasn't then and it's not now. There, there was no technology reason why people couldn't live, remote, live and work remotely. It was more of a psychological issue. So it was that, and, and I, was, I was perplexed and intrigued by that question. So that's what got me intrigued. So uh, fast forward to about one year ago, it, last October, I met uh, Ho Yin Chung, the founder of Remo, uh, who I think you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we we kind of hit it off, and we thought, hey, let's just for fun, since this remote work thing is still kind of a new idea and a, and a, and a kind of a niche community, let's um let's put together like a little remote summit on remote work, and so we did we did kind of a little proof of concept event that was about thirty people, and the whole conversation was really around is remote really going to happen? When's it going to happen? How far out, you know, is this tra transformation really going to happen? Because we see all these benefits. Um, but, but it was really, you know, at the time, still a, a very nascent uh, and niche idea. And so, and so fast forward to COVID happening. And then, you know, as we all know, we, we all became remote workers overnight. And, uh, and so that's, that's what inspired me to, to do another event uh, called the Remote Startup Expo, um, which I, I th you know, we've talked about before, uh, which was in April. And that's, you know, was a much bigger event. Uh, it was also on the Remo platform, but we had CEOs and founders of Threads, Loom, uh, Deal, Remote.com, uh, Tandem Chat, et cetera. And, uh, and we had 450 people show up. So, and, and then we're doing another one in October, which I, I think we're going to talk, talk about as well. So, so uh, in long story short, everything changed. Um, 
And the, the, the quote I'm using and, and partially stealing, uh, but I don't, I don't feel too terribly about it, is that while in some sense, like a lot of people think that this whole remote work trend is overhyped, uh, I believe, along with some of my friends, is that it's still underhyped. Like we're still trying to wrap our heads around what this actually means for our broader economy and not just, you know, not just this little niche, but, but everyone. So that's, that's my, my kind of thoughts on what's changed. So you think VCs are still skeptical of remote companies, even though there's been change, do you think they're still not fully bought? They haven't bought into the idea fully yet. Yeah. Excellent question. And I would, uh, I would prefer to, um, I would prefer to segment uh, that question into two different parts. So on one part, there is the whole category of remote work tools and remote work productivity tools. Um, so that's, that's uh, number one. And number two would be uh, companies, regardless of what they're building, that happen to be remote first internally. So, so just taking those separately, in the first category, I think what we're seeing is, is uh, a, a major appetite from VCs to invest in those categories. Uh, I mean, you're seeing that in some of the, the valuations um, of companies like, like, like Miro and, and Deal um, and Remote.com, Mural, uh, Notion, uh, just, just this morning, Rome uh, announced a, a fundraise. So I think you're seeing that in the valuations as well as the pace of how soon some of these companies raise after their previous round, right? So rather than taking 18 months, I think just because of the appetite from VCs, you're seeing rounds that are happening within six months of a company closing a previous round. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement there. Uh, the, the flip side of that, which always happens, is you have some VCs saying like, well, those, now, now it's an overhyped space and valuations are too high and whatnot. And, and so there's a, there's a healthy debate over on that side. The second category, is, is perhaps more interesting, which is how are VCs viewing remote companies internally? And I would say, you know, historically, if you look at the history of VC, VC has always been sort of a, a, a cottage industry where people are really looking in their backyards. Uh, and, and that's why uh, Silicon Valley has had such uh, network effects and clustering effects because there's, there's such a concentration of capital as well as concentration of entrepreneurs and tech, uh, tech folks who are starting companies. Uh, and then you have, you have VCs that specialize in uh, developing communities of startups and founders in New York and Seattle and Austin and whatnot that, that can be quite successful there. Um, so, but with this change, um, I think VCs are starting to realize, uh, you know, and, and have had to come to grips with the fact that a, you can't, you know, you can't just invest in your backyard. Um, B, you, uh, whereas you used to be able to invest in maybe a, a company across the country, but you could go visit them, they could come visit you. That's changed too. So you have to get comfortable as a VC with investing in uh, potentially a founder you've never met. Um, and then the third piece is uh, traditionally, you know, as a VC, you kind of want all the founders in a in the same building, in the same room, and, and not just the founders, but the whole team. Um, but that that's no longer becoming relevant um, and in becoming a reality, especially, I would argue, if you want to invest in the first category, which is the remote tools companies, because oftentimes they eat their own dog food and they are remote first co companies internally themselves. So, um, so where I come out on it is I think if you... Like if you want to be a modern uh, VC, you have to become comfortable with uh, remote work yourself internally. And that includes investing in companies um, that are not in your backyard. That includes investing in companies that are dispersed as a remote strategy. Um, and, and third being um, net, like once you make the investment, managing those companies and, and keeping close relationships with uh, those companies, whether on a board level or on, a, on on an ongoing basis, so 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 all these things are changing for VCs, and VCs are are you know are, there's a spectrum of how well uh, VCs are adopt uh, adapting to that uh, to that new landscape. Interesting, for you personally, is there any particular type of company that you're really interested in? You know, there, I mean, it could be remote companies, it could be um, you know these specific tools. For you personally, what's what gets you really excited? Yeah, great question. Um, so, 
So in general, uh, the, what I'm interested in right now is, uh, is specifically on this topic of remote work. It's, it's, for me, it's not just limited to what are, what's, the next, what's the next remote productivity tool. It's thinking more holistically around, we had this, we had this black swan event, which is the pandemic. Um, it, it, it created this global work from home kind of breakthrough in terms of the, the psychological barriers we talked about. And so the question that I'm, I'm really intrigued by right now is what are the long-term, short-term and long-term implications of that shift beyond just productivity, but in, in kind of every sector of our economy? And, and that's, that's really one of the questions um, that we're, we're seeking to start answer um, or at least start answering in the, uh, the upcoming Remote Startup Expo coming up uh, on October 14th which is, you know, who are the, who's winning in the new normal? Uh, and so to give you a few examples, there are companies that, and if you talk to a bunch of VCs, you'll find in every VC portfolio, they have one or two companies that when COVID started, they were expecting that company to be on the triage list. Like, oh boy, we're, you know, we really got to worry about this company or, you know, how can we support them? And then unexpectedly, they have these tailwinds. That and they're just taking off. So that includes uh, companies across healthcare, education, commerce, uh, uh, kind of uh, infrastructure, and and beyond. And so those are the types of uh, of uh, founders and CEOs that we have coming to speak at the event. And uh, and I would say, so it's not one specific sector. It's not one specific technology. It's kind of the intersection of of how this is all coming together you know, post, post pandemic and global work from home. Right. So that's what I'm most interested in is figuring out that, that, uh, that answer to that question. Awesome. Let's switch gears a little bit to talk about some of the, the things that founders are really interested in, you know, when they're, when they're going to interviews, do you have any tips, you know, things that get you um, really to pay attention when you're in that interview process? Are there any things you're looking to hear founders say, you know, when they're pitching to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, one just very simple, you know, you, of course we could talk strategically and we could talk tactically, but one just very quick tactic that I, I recognize in terms of pattern net matching is I find that the best, in, the best entrepreneurs at the very beginning of a discussion with a VC will, will basically ask the VC to start talking first. We'll, at, we'll say, hey, tell me about your firm Tell me about how you're different than all the other firms and how you add value to the companies that you invest in. Um, and whenever I see that, I, I, I pay attention a little bit clo more closely because it makes me feel like they, they have discriminating tastes when it comes to who they want to work with. Um, and just like dating, it's, it's sort of a, a cat and mouse type of a game where you don't want to give the impression that you're, you're kind of desperate and you're, you're, you, you know, you'll work with anyone. You want to give the impression that you know your value and you want to work with someone. <laughs> you want to work with someone of, of similar value that where you can both bring things to the table. So as a, as a, as a, as a tactic, I think that's, that's, uh, that's quite effective. And then, you know, there, there, are, there are a whole host of other things that, that, you know, I look for and, and that uh, VCs will look for across uh, you know, what does the team look like? What's their background? What are their experiences? What's their unique insight um, is one thing I usually look for is, uh, you know, anyone can kind of come up with an idea and ideas, ideas are dime a dozen, but do you have a specific insight that is unique or was, was, was uh, derived from a specific ex unique experience? And then have you amassed the team to, that's going to be one of the best teams in the world to uh, to execute on that on that plan, uh, and so so it's a combination of of you know the right the right insight the right team and then the right uh, execution plan and then layered on top of that of course is is all, all the preparation and uh, other tactical things you can do um, to like know your pitch backwards and forwards to prepare very strong and well designed materials uh, and then and then the last piece would just be practice. Like you can't, you can't go pitch to 10 VCs 
and expect to get a term sheet unless you're, you know, you're, you're just on a, you've done it a million times. If you're relatively new to the pitch game, you need to, you need to build the funnel just like you would in sales. You need to have a very wide funnel and you need to uh, pitch to as many people as possible because over time you will get better, your pitch will get better, and you'll become more comfortable. So that's what I would advise for, for anyone who's, who's fundraising and pitching a VC. If you have remote teams who are, they're essentially, you know, pitching over video calls, is there anything particular you know, that you look for to kind of help overcome that trust deficit of not being in the same room as them? Is there anything that, um, any advice you'd give for those kinds of remote interactions? Yeah, I, I, I'd say there are two things. One would be, uh, one would be that I think you want to, the the bar for material for the actual like written uh, and and kind of pitch materials is higher virtually because you can't rely as much on your personality in the room being able to take over. Um, I think you know having very well crafted materials showing a narrative that helps me as the VC walk through that logic, ideally before the call is the best. But even during the call, I think is, is uh, like the bar is even higher. So, so I think more preparation and more work um, on the materials is important. And then the second piece would be like outside of the pitch would be creating connective tissue between your like social capital between yourselves and the investor. Um, basically just just understanding who you know in common with that person. And that can both help you get the initial meeting, but as well as kind of strengthen that credibility that you have is, Hey, I'm not just some random person in some random part of the world that might be trying to miss, you know, miss, uh, mislead you in some way. It's more like, Hey, we, we all know the same people. Uh, I, or at least we have a few people in common that can uh, provide a credibility uh, for me as, as an entrepreneur. If we're going to talk tough, tough love, okay, um, there are things that maybe founders aren't aware of, but they're going to face these kind of challenges. What are, you know, maybe your top three biggest challenges you think they need to know that they might not be aware of right now? Yeah. So number one would be, uh, would be that, you know, one, I would say downside to this whole remote uh, situation is that, <clears throat> for you know, I think because of the old school psychological barrier that some VCs have, um, there's a, a a added level of comfort I think with people who happen to be in your physical vicinity, even if you can't physically or or, or have no plans to physically visit them. Um, and, and I've just been noticing this, uh, and, and I'm not saying it's the right thing or, or that this is the way it should be. But I think if you're physically located in a similar um, area as someone, I think it helps um, uh, psychologically. And that, that's, that's kind of an unfair uh, truth that I think, you know, you either need to take advantage of if you happen to be there or, uh, or just acknowledge and overcome if you're not there. Um, the second thing is I, I would say just be prepared for this, uh, for this resistance, I think generally to uh, remote first teams, teams that aren't physically located um, in the same area. Uh, again, like I'm not saying that's right or fair, and, and I try not to, to, to have that bias, but I think it is a subconscious bias that uh, many teams feel like, how serious are, is this team? Are they, just, you know, are they just goofing around you know, on the weekends, or, or is this something they're both really committed to? Um, I would say those are the main two things just to be aware of. Not, not that you can necessarily change them or, or even that you should change them, but you should be aware of some of those biases um, that exist. That's the reality. Yeah. Do you have any specific examples, like for you, you know, um, indicators that say this, this is a successful founder, something that maybe their, other, their peers don't do? Are you the kind of VC who looks for responses to emails, you know, right away? You know, what indicators really matter for you? Yeah, I, I would say, I would say um, one one kind of person. I'm not saying this is the only persona, but one persona that I'm attracted to uh, right now is the persona of the founder who's also a community leader. Um, so you're seeing this more in in the in the past couple of years, where uh, where you see founders like while they're raising their business or right, while they're starting their business. They're, they, they're running a podcast or they're, 
uh, or they're building a community on Slack, or they're really active on social media and they're, they're a thought leader. Um, that, that is a persona that I think um, is like, even in this modern era of social media and, and, um, and whatnot, I think that's a persona that's still undervalued. Um, I think people, especially for like first time founders, I think it's a unique uh, edge that, uh, that, that can provide you some advantages, like some real business advantages uh, in the short and long term. And so, you know, I, I, and so just kind of, to kind of summarize it, I would say someone who is a, is a thought leader and can, and can amass attention from peers in a specific niche before, like, in some cases, even before they have a, a real market ready product, I think is, is super intriguing to me. So, so that's something to consider is just like thinking outside the box. It's not necessarily just about, okay, the pitch and, and, and who I know. It's like, what can you do outside of that um, to, to really like show that you're, you're in the movement? Okay. I like that. I've been, we've been hearing about a com- like communities a lot lately. Um, so it's interesting to think even from the VC angle, community or social presence is still something that's, that's quite important. Um, on a slightly different note, I'd like to ask you about your podcast. Um, so you have a podcast called the Epic Human Podcast. I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think makes an epic human? Because I think you probably meet a lot of people in your career. Um, and so how do you define someone who's epic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so it, it's probably worth mentioning that um, the, the podcast was inspired by uh, my grandmother, uh, whose name is Eileen Blair. Um, she, she is, she is a woman who, uh, who grew up in rural Jamaica um, in extraordinarily poor um, and difficult circumstances, you know, lived in a, a two bedroom house with seven brothers and sisters, um, had to beg for food, had to, you know, beg for clothes, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, miraculously uh, met my grandfather in Jamaica, immigrated to the U S in, in the fifties to New York city. And then they, they grew up, they grew a family, they grew a, a business, they grew a life. They basically, you know, experienced the American dream. And so, uh, so what happened was about 10, 12 years ago, um, I was down in Florida visiting my grandmother and she, by that time my grandfather had passed so she was living alone and um, I, I got the sense, just this feeling that she was like, this was one of the last times I was going to have a one-on-one uh, interaction with her and this was in the early days of smartphones. <laughs> um, I got an Android at the time. And, uh, and so I basically sat down with her and I was like, listen, tell me all the stories from the old days. Um, and she was always great at, you know, telling these stories. And she had this amazing Jamaican accent um, that was very much her own. And, uh, and so we sat down for like three days and uh, basically had her retell all the, the stories from Jamaica, from, from New York uh, and, and so on. And I recorded them on my smartphone. Now, I, I've been very public about this is that I'm a little bit ashamed in that, you know, I did not ask her permission, but it's because she was sort of a private person and uh, I knew she would say no. And, and if she said no, then we would lose as a family, all those stories. And lo and behold, she ended up passing, unfortunately, a couple years after that. And at, and then we all went down to Florida for the, for the wake, the funeral and whatnot. And we listened to those stories as a family. And it was like, it was just a light bulb moment for me of like, wow, the power of the human voice, the how the power of, stories from ordinary people like this woman is not a famous person right like you know but 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 her stories and the stories of so many people that you and i know are just incredibly compelling and so when i think about an epic human i of course inspired by her but you know to to generalize i would say you know people who overcome odds uh people who are risk takers and people who are uh like very hard workers and that hard work leads to high performance in any, in any kind of measure or, or any sort of um, activity or, or uh, uh, any sort of facet of the life, whether it's like professional or, or, or non-professional. So that's the way I think about the Epic Human Podcast. So, so yeah, we have, um, you know, we have folks from VC, we have folks from that are founders, but also like athletes, uh, uh, professors, uh, authors. So it really runs the gamut and, and, you know, it's, it's anyone who fits those, uh, those descriptions. Awesome. I love that. All right. So time for some fun questions, some rapid fire questions. And on a lighter note, um, so this is a little bit about you personally. So what's the first thing you do in the morning and last thing you do at night? 
Okay, so when I'm at my best, I will wake up at 3.45 a.m. and I will work out at 4 a.m. for about an hour. Sometimes when I'm not at my best, I will use that time to work, so, uh, at, which I don't recommend. But, <laughs> but that's, that's like my, my morning routine that I try to stick to. Um, and then in, in the evenings, I'm literally, uh, you know, uh, because I wake up so early and at, at night I'm usually kind of clean, you know, washing dishes and, and cleaning up around the house. I literally just, as soon as I'm done with everything, I just crash and I just go to bed. I have very uh, little uh, trouble sleeping generally. <laughs> awesome. That's a, that's a good problem to have. You fall asleep very easily. Who's the most interesting person you follow on Twitter? Yeah, this is this is a great one. So I, I don't know if I can say um, that they're, you know, my personal uh, most interesting um, that I've come across, but two that come to mind. Um, one is uh, Del Johnson. Uh, he's at Del Johnson VC. He's a uh, New York based VC who's been very outspoken and um, and witty and and humorous uh, despite everything that's happened. Um, you know, in, in terms of civil rights movement here in the U S uh, and then another would be uh, girl, Alex, who's another VC um, that I've been kind of friends with on Twitter for a while. And we recently just, just met. And I would say the, the common thread would be uh, between those two and people generally I enjoy would be uh, would be irreverent, witty, humorous, but, but also like good hearted and, uh, and, and grounded in ethics. So I would recommend those people to anybody. Cool. What blog or newsletter do you recommend people subscribe to? Yeah, this is a tough one. I don't actually uh, s subscribe to many blogs these days just because I do so much reading in my in my day to day work. Um, but I am an audiophile. Um, so the, the podcast I'd recommend right now, um, which is like a lesser known podcast so far because it's new, is one called Positive with a with a two for the T. Um, and it's by uh, a friend of mine uh, named Zeka, uh, who's a phenomenal uh, host and is really trying to unpack impact and, and what that means across a, a, a number of dimensions. And he actually had me on um, to discuss uh, diversity and inclusion uh, as, as related to remote work. So that's a podcast that people uh, can check out. What's the non-obvious remote work tool that you can't live without? So not Zoom, not Slack. <laughs> Yeah, so this is probably going to be an unexpected answer, but it's, it's uh, one I bought just recently, which is actually the light that's illuminating me right now, which plugs into my USB port. I have one too. It's so good. Yeah. It, it, really, it, it really makes a big difference because I've always, I've, I've always been that uh, guy that's kind of in the shadows. And in, Does like, it look like, apartment. is it this kind of selfie light thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It looks like that. It looks like that. It, except it, it, clips, it clips to the top of my uh, computer. I guess I could actually even show it. Yeah, you have the mini version. I have like the one with the stand. Yeah. Definitely yeah, recommend yeah. for anyone who works remotely, it makes a huge difference. You don't look like you're, you know, in a cave somewhere. Yeah, don't, don't look like a golem. Yeah, exactly. So, I, so I'd recommend that. <laughs> if you weren't an entrepreneur or VC, what job would you love to do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, what, what comes to mind for me is, uh, is stand-up comedian. And, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't claim to be intelligent or, uh, or funny enough to, to, be, uh, to be one. But, uh, but I do love making people laugh, especially like uh, my kids. And so maybe I would, I would specialize in, you know, uh, a stand-up comedian for children. <laughs> love it. Okay, well, final question. What book has had the greatest impact on you? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very deep question. There's a, there's a number um, that I could mention. But um, the one that comes to mind, again, it's an audio book. Um, it's a very old book. It, it, it's called uh, Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. Uh, and it came out in 1968. And this was a, a, an audio book that my, my dad had on cassette. And anytime we went on long car trips, like just me and him, like and whatnot, he would always pop it in. And in the early days, I was like very resistant to like this, like, what's this self-help kind of thing. But, um, but you know, I, I think the, the brainwashing worked because it's the type of thing I still listen to about once a year. And it just has these like kind of timeless truths about how to live a life of value. 
And, uh, and you know, again, it was, it was made in 1968. So in some ways it's a little bit outdated and you have to translate it to the modern context. But I think some of those kind of inherent um, philosophical truths uh, still remain true today. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Joe. It's been wonderful having you. And we'll see you next time. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, Christine.